You're listening to The Local Maximum, episode 112. Time to expand your perspective. Welcome to The Local Maximum. Now, here's your host, Max Klar. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. You have reached another Local Maximum. This is Monday, March 30th, 2020. Still inside my apartment, as I mentioned in this week's discussion, which was recorded a few days ago. Everything's still good in here. I can't really complain. Uh, So far, it's okay. We'll see what happens. But I think that the next two weeks, that's the first two weeks of April and this year, are really going to be the key to getting a handle on how long the coronavirus shut-in is going to last and how our hospitals and EMTs and doctors here in New York uh, can handle it. Uh, the, The peak doesn't necessarily mean that we can go out again immediately, but as the percentage in cases per day starts to go down, and it looks like it's already starting to go down, although you never know, that could be temporary, I get uh, less worry about our, our medical capacity and our infrastructure starting to be constrained. So um, yeah, basically, I'm just going to try to hunker down for the next two weeks and, uh, and, and see what happens. So we'll see. I can't say that this is the most stressful time in my life, which is kind of... Um, you know, might be surprising for people, maybe future generations to hear. It really isn't. Uh, you know, I have a fun job at Foursquare, and now I'm, while I'm inside, I'm kind of, we're kind of doing our part to provide uh, the location and mobility data to aid the coronavirus fight. And honestly, I figured out a way to make living inside my apartment to be quite comfortable, and no one's hounding me to go out. So that's that's pretty cool. But uh, I I really do feel for my friends in the medical world and who are essential and need to work with people all day. Take care of yourselves, and and thank you for what you're doing, and good luck. We're all rooting for you. All right. So I have a great guest for you today, Naomi Brockwell. She's been a guest in the past. Um, Very great person to talk to. Way back in episode 37, actually, when The Local Maximum was just a baby of a podcast. That was like two years ago. And I've been listening to her podcast episodes because uh, she had really great coverage of things like cryptocurrency and privacy online and 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 the and the situation in Hong Kong the riots in China but obviously she switched a little bit to coronavirus as she was covering China and so she got that story really early on and she got it right really early on which a lot of other people didn't so let's get an update on everything Naomi Brockwell you've reached another local maximum uh thanks for coming on the show on such short notice and uh and in, in the current circumstances. No, it's a uh, delight to be here as always. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I, it, it's crazy. We're all, I, I, sometimes I do the podcast where I kind of ignore what's going on outside or in the rest of the world. So it's sort of been impossible for the last few weeks. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're all kind of shut in and terrified. And, um, but uh, you've really been on a roll with, uh, with your podcasting and uh, all the issues you're covering. And so uh, I, I'm really glad that you're stopping in uh, first of all, like you sounded the alarm in terms of us actually having to make big changes in our lives from coronavirus on, on your podcast. I look back, it was all the way back in February 27th. Uh, so that was before a lot of people were, I was, I was not canceling my events on February 27th. I was kind of hoping we would, <laughs> we wouldn't have to until maybe, mm-hmm. until maybe 10 days after that. Uh, how did people react when you put that out? Oh, they were not happy. I actually, so I was very, um, I I got back to America, I think it was like February 17th. I had done three conferences in Mexico. And at that time I was, I was concerned. Like I'd been following this since the start of January um, because I went to Hong Kong on January 6th and I've been in all of these Hong Kong threads watching what's going on with the protests. And since the end of last year, they started talking about this coronavirus and no one else was talking about it. And I was watching this and then I was watching all of the media outlets get shut down. I was watching journalists in China get thrown in jail for reporting on this. And I'm just like, what is going on? And then they issued this apology and said, oh no, the scientists, they sounded the alarm, we're sorry. Um, And so I've been following this really closely. And in January, middle of January, I was like, okay, we should start getting things. So I was in Australia at the time. And, um, and I was like, well, I've got a bunch of travel coming up. I've got a bunch of conferences. I'm going to buy hand sanitizer. I'm going to buy face masks. I'm going to just get prepared, you know? Yeah. And they're already sold out in Australia. 
And I'm like, what? And so then I called America, called some people there and said, go to your local CVS, buy a bunch of hand sanitizer and face masks. And they said, you won't believe it, but it's already sold out. And I'm like, okay. And no one's talking about prepping at this stage. No one's really talking about it. And I'm like, okay, there are some people who are watching this and who are on it. And so I joined a bunch of groups that are filled with uh, all kinds of scientists who are discussing what's coming. And then I started to think, okay, this is serious. So I went to Mexico for three conferences with um, much trepidation. I was, I was a little nervous. And when I got back on like the 17th of Feb, I was like, okay, we're shutting down. Um, and so then it took a lot. Like I, I just was organizing movers for my apartment. I was like organizing all this stuff to like really clamp down. And, um, and then at at this stage, and I'm busy, like, I think we talked just before this video started about how you kind of go into this research spiral and like in my head, I'm like, okay, I got to make all these preparations and I got to make these videos and warn people all this stuff. What I'd end up doing is I just pull up my computer and start researching. And the more research I just kind of descend into this like anxiety spiral where I'm watching all this stuff, just like, Oh my God. So I ended up not putting stuff out as early <laughs> I as I would have liked. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what happened to me. I was like, Oh, I'm so much time for podcasting. And now that I've gotten used to the new normal, maybe, uh, maybe I have more right. time, but I was like, Oh my God, I have no more guests. I have no more. What am I going to do? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I'm up till three in the morning checking Twitter, which is <laughs> not good for me. And, and then it's like, if you ask me the next day, so what did you learn on Twitter last night? If there's no one here that will ask me that, but if, if some, if there was someone, who, 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 like, you know, it was like, like, you know, you're growing up, what did you learn in school today? If I got that, I would not be able to say anything definitively yeah. from yeah. looking at Twitter all night. No, uh, for sure. Well, the response that I got from putting out these videos, because I, I, I did start to put out videos and, you know, it's, it bothered me how a lot of people were responding to this. So um, I have a lot of very smart friends and these smart friends, their immediate reaction is always skepticism. And I appreciate yeah. that. I appreciate the skepticism, but I think that they were skeptical with blindness as well. There was, they just kind of ended at skeptic. They didn't bother looking further. They didn't bother looking at data. So I always appreciate a good skeptic, but they were saying like, Oh, this is overblown. You know, this is ridiculous. And, um, And they just weren't looking at the data. Like we had exponentially growing numbers and I didn't see them slowing down anytime soon. So I was like, okay, I was kind of doing the math and saying, well, start of March, we're going to be here. End of March, we're going to be here. And I've I've been pretty accurate with uh, (laughs) with the numbers that I was was kind of coming up with. And everyone was just kind of turning a blind eye. And it's only now that they're starting to see the consequence, like what's actually happening, that people are taking action. But right at the start, I mean, people still are saying, well, you know, um, what I don't appreciate is the blind panic and I don't appreciate the hysteria and I just want a rational response to the situation. But my biggest issue is that when I was proposing a rational response, you know, a month ago, uh, two months ago to people in my circle, that just my friends, um, I wasn't running around screaming in hysterics. I was advocating okay, well, you should go to the store and get some stocks, like plan to be indoors for at least a month. Uh, There's probably, you're probably going to want to socially distance. Um, I was advocating just avoiding public spaces. These are not the signs of hysterics. These are the signs of people who were looking at the data and saying, you should probably prepare because this is what's coming. And the fact that people are still saying like, well, you know, I, I never was against that stuff. I was just against all the hysterics. I think that they kind of memory hold these, um, this the context of what people were saying. Like, I think that even now people are, um, they're now moving on to the next level of preparedness and calling that hysterics. And I think that really, I mean, there's no room for panic right now. I think people shouldn't be panicking and you and I, we're probably panicking too much. You know, we're probably reading Twitter at 3am and it's not good, but people do need to understand what's going on and they do need to be responsible. And a lot of people don't have the luxury of working from home. So if you can work from home, you absolutely should be. A lot of states are now shutting down. It's crazy. All the mandated shutdowns. Like I, I'm, I'm actually against all the government mandated stuff, uh, but that's just right. like a personal thing. But I think. Yeah, no, if- my, my, my co I was on the phone with my co-host last night, Aaron, who a lot of people listen to the show knows. And he, he said the same exact thing. Mm. He's like, everyone should stay in, but maybe we shouldn't make people. Absolutely. I think that people should have the room to make calculated risks. Uh, there are, I mean, Gosh, 
the numbers just came out for recent unemployment numbers, 3 million. This is far more than they even predict, predicted. They were predicting 2 million, but we're at 3 million. Um, and so I just think that we're in for such an economically disastrous time coming up. You have the Fed that is just pumping out money, um, devaluing everyone's savings. You've, you've got the amount of debt that we're going into at the moment is insane. Um, the, they've mandated all these businesses shut down, even even in areas where I, I think that, I mean, so let, let me back up a little bit. The biggest issue with the response to this has been the CDC and the fact that right at the start, they had a monopoly on testing. They said like the, who was handing out uh, tests and the CDC in America said, no, 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 we don't need your tests. We're going to make our own. And then they screwed it up. They contaminated batches and it, it, it didn't work. And so we were so behind on testing that we were not able to isolate this and track this and quarantine the right people. So now the government is responding by saying, well, we'll just put a blanket rule on it. We'll quarantine everyone, which is economically disastrous and not in people's best interests. People should have been able to recognize, well, that's a red zone. That's a green zone. And, you know, we'll lock down that. We'll track the people who are actually sick. Who have they been in contact with? We'll track those. That's how you respond. That's how countries like Taiwan have responded. Singapore have responded. And they've done a great job. But America has now is now responding with these crazy measures that are bankrupting so many people. And I think the economic hardship that we're in for is just going to be disastrous in the next year. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's a shame. I mean, right now, to be honest, I'm just worried about getting through the next few weeks. And right. like, then we're worried about the economics. I can't control what Congress does, but... Right. Well, I, I, I don't know. But yeah, everyone uh, on the channel um, was telling me when my videos were coming out, they were all saying I'm a fear monger and I you know, should be ashamed of myself for believing the mainstream media. Uh, and I'm like, the mainstream media is parroting the government narrative right now. The government narrative at that time was keep going as usual. Don't change your daily habits. I recorded a clip in one of my videos of a press conference from that day where they literally said, do not change your habits, continue as normal. Um, I was the one saying the opposite. I was saying, no, you're going to want to try flatten the curve and stay in and be socially responsible because a lot of people can't stay in and you don't want to take up hospital beds if you don't have to so it's people will respond however they want to respond though it, it, yeah it's so strange like the the well I, I, I always pick on the mayor here in New York, but he, it's worth it. But, <laughs> it is what, he, he brings it on himself. <laughs> but I, I feel like it, it was, you know, a, a month ago, he was like, everybody, don't worry, go out, have a good time, to like, oh, we're all going to be dead in two weeks. And yeah. I'm, I'm just like, either way, it, it's just, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's it, it, uh, either way <laughs> bothers me. Well, you also have to realize that a lot of the people who are putting out these press conferences, they're doing things that are in their best interest. They're not necessarily mm -hmm. looking out for the public good. They're looking out for what's in their good, um, a, 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 what's good for them. And so, you know, when you have things like, like the CDC talking about face masks and saying, oh, well, you know, you don't really need them and la la la. And, and why are they saying that? Because there's a giant shortage all over the world and they don't want people to panic. But it's false information and that's dangerous mm -hmm. information because if you look at studies, it's very clear that not even just N95 masks, any face mask decreases the risk of you getting uh, infected with a virus. And I, I've posted studies on my videos um, supporting all of that. There are lots of studies into this. So the fact that they're going out there and saying, no, face masks don't do anything, I think is, is irresponsible. And they're just covering themselves because no one was prepared. No one was stockpiling these things. Instead, we're spending trillions of dollars, you know, still at wars in places where we shouldn't be and no money on stockpiling. I mean, I, I think that it's dangerous information and individuals should have the right information so that they can prepare for themselves because clearly the government has proven that they've just let people down a huge amount of this. A lot of people were relying on the government for good information, for accurate information and uh, for good responses. They've been completely let down. And I think hopefully this should be a wake up call for people People, that they should maybe be looking out for themselves and preparing on their own because uh, at the end of the day, you know, they're the only ones who are going to be looking out for them. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I, don't, are, I don't know if you're stuck here in, in New York City or, or, or where you are right now, but here in Brooklyn, it's like, it's nerve wracking because I've got a, there's the elevator to get out of here. And right. if I just have to go down to pick up one simple thing, you know, I'm, I go in and I'm like, oh my God, I got close to maybe four people, five people on the way out of the, yeah. <laughs> I'm just covering. And so, um, 
I would yeah. recommend wearing a mask and wearing gloves whenever you go out, even if it's yeah. just a homemade mask. It's what, better yeah, than... what type of, how could you make a, a homemade mask? Is that possible? I mean, even masks out of cloth are going to be better than, yeah. than nothing. Oh, like so, so a ski mask would work. Um, so anything that, that covers your face, people are using, uh, repurposing snorkel masks. People mm. are building masks with 3D printers now. They're building respirators with 3D, 3D printers. Uh, there's all kinds of innovation going on around this, which that's the exciting thing, seeing how communities are coming together. I have a friend who's repurposed all of his 3D printers and is just focused on building masks for hospitals right now. The problem is that there are so many regulations that are holding this innovation back. There were regulations that were holding back companies that were creating their own tests because the CDC uh, had none available. I had friends who went to get COVID testing done because they had been exposed to people who tested positive. They had all of the symptoms. Uh, they were finding it hard to breathe. Like they, they were delusional. They were in fever and they were being refused tests because they hadn't recently traveled to China or Italy. And, you know, that, that kind of stuff is crazy, but you had the government that still had all these regulations on other people doing testing who were trying to pick up the slack. Now you've got the same issues with governments who, um, government rules that are saying, well, you know, only approved respirators in hospitals, only, you know, treatments that have been approved. That stuff takes like 18 months at least, and that's when it's expedited. And you're going to see a tremendous amount of death um, happen before then. So I just think it's crazy that there's still so much regulation around this. We're starting to see some of it list, lifted, like um, there are rules that, that hospitals can only have masks, they're no longer certified if they're reused, but now masks, like hospitals are just in such short supply of masks that they're having to disinfect them, hang them up, put them under UV lighting to kill germs, and they're repurposing it knowing that they're not wearing certified masks anymore. And I think that we need to have leeway where we can figure out like, okay, what's the most innovative way that we could be decontaminating these things so that they are safe, you know, rather than just this archaic rules that say, well, it's no longer certified if it's reused. We're in a situation where we have to reuse things. So what can we be doing? Like, how do we, we shift those rules to make it easier for hospitals to do the right things to, you know, give the most protection to people. And uh, I just like to see that move as fast as, as the private sector is moving in it and as fast as innovation is moving it at the moment. Yeah, I think when this is said and done, uh, you know, we look back, there are going to be a lot of stories of really clever, um, clever things that people did to, to cope with the situation. Of course, it's, you know, it's, it's little, it's, um, I don't know, it's not as much comfort right now as it's going through, as we're going through this, but uh, I, I, I see a lot of uh, reports of, you know, companies repurposing factories to make respirators and, and things like that that are, uh, well, if I was just talking about regular tech innovation, I would say this is exciting, but I, now I don't say that's exciting. I'd say maybe a relief, but uh, uh, yeah. So I, I don't know what, how to deal with this on the podcast. I just tell people, hey, take all these precautions. Here's what I'm doing and let's hope for the best. But how, how are you going to continue to cover this on the podcast? What's your... What's going to be I think that, um, I think, well, my next video is about uh, voluntary versus mandatory quarantine. Mm. Um, because I think that right now, because we've gone from one extreme to the other, we've gone from, oh, complete apathy, this is nothing, it'll blow over, you're hysterical, to, oh my God, we need the government to come in and shut down everything. And I think that we just miss a tremendous amount of space in between um, that I want to look at. Like right now, we're losing a huge amount of civil liberties and I think they'll be hard to get back afterwards. So mm. right now I'm, I'm focused on still encouraging people to take um, you know, their own individual precautions, you know, individual responsibility, I think is tremendously important right now, but also don't just immediately drop, jump in the, what laws can we introduce? How can we mandate things? How can we coerce people? I think that, um, you know, so much of the innovation, I mean, it's all coming from the private sector right now and from individuals who are just saying, okay, I'm just going to go ahead with this and get permission later. And I think that we need to be looking at what other countries have been doing that haven't had such strong blanket rules that don't make much sense in my opinion and not be so quick to just give up all of our liberties right now. We're going into a very disastrously economically bad time. And, um, and so I think that people need to be smart um, and not dig themselves too much into a hole that they won't be able to get out of afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I think afterwards, we're all going to have to 
reassess um, certain things, I'm like, <laughs> I can't escape from New York. <laughs> maybe I should work towards getting that. Uh, right. You know, may maybe the uh, at this point, I'm just going to ride it out. But um, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I think people who make preparations, I think we're all going to uh, maybe introduce some 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 more basic like sanitary. Yeah, um, I was thinking that the other lives. day. I'm watching all these celebrities do these videos, like Selena Gomez does this video, which is like, this is how you wash your hands, you know, through your thumbs and going through. And I'm like, wow, it took this pandemic to teach people how to wash their hands. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. and maybe these are good habits that because a lot of the Asian countries, they say that a lot of the reason why they're coping so well is because they've dealt with SARS, they've dealt with MERS. And so they of course they're wearing a lot more face masks they're um uh, maybe a lot more hygienic in terms of so physical contact and hand washing so maybe these are good habits that we will pick up as well uh but also in terms of like changing changes that we're going to see as an aftermath and you saying you know you, you have trouble escaping new york so many companies were not geared towards working remotely. We have all the tools at our fingertips, yet all these companies like Google has had a tremendously hard time transitioning people to work mm. remotely. Um, and I think that we're going to see this be kind of this uh, push towards more remote working, more decentralization of the workforce. I think that's really interesting because you might see a kind of break away from these big city centers and see more people finding a place that has some land, doing dance classes in their basement, um, you know, working from home. I think that this is going to create a shift in society that may have long lasting effects. Yeah. I mean, there is another side to that. I've been, I've enjoyed being in here for a while. I'm, I guess I'm an introvert because uh, I'm people are like, aren't you, uh, aren't you drive crazy being alone? I'm like, yeah, I could do it. I could probably do it. For yeah. I, yeah. But, I'm fine. <laughs> as, as one of my friends uh, uh, told me, staying inside on my computer and not talking to anyone for weeks, I've been preparing my whole life for this. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, um, but I do miss, you know, going into the office and, you know, working with three or four people. Look, I don't like when there's like hundreds of people in the office. I could do without that. But when it's like three, four of us working on a project and we're like on the whiteboard and we're bouncing ideas off of each other in person, you can't really replicate that uh, very well uh, virtually. Yeah, I think that there's a big adjustment period coming up and companies are going to have to figure out how do you try to replicate that? Like I've seen some companies implement um, like buddy systems where every day you get paired with a different person and you just do your work on a live call with someone all day. So you're just sitting there, you have someone to bounce ideas off. Things like that um, are interesting. As you said, like it's not going to, it's not going to completely um, replace what we're used to in that social environment it, things are going to be different but i do think that you know there are trade-offs on both sides maybe people are more productive or they have more hours in the day if they're not commuting and they say that you know commute time leads to people's unhappiness a lot of the time so you know we we are going to see trade-offs on both directions um and it's going to be interesting to see how like when this comes down how society readjusts after that like which parts do we keep and which parts do we go back to one thing that I, I've been thinking about this whole time is like, imagine if this thing happened 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, we wouldn't be able to all work from home. I mean, maybe 10% of the people who would be able to work from home would have to. And, you know, we wouldn't have all this contactless payment um, technology in there. It's, it's, um, it's pretty unbelievable that... Uh, that this didn't happen earlier. And I kind of shudder to think what it would be like if, if it did. Right. It's, um, it is pretty scary. I mean, also keep in mind on the other side of things is that right now we're seeing the exponentially growing numbers. And so we're getting worried and we're hearing about the overwhelm in the hospitals. I mean, it is possible that if something like this happened 20 years ago, we just wouldn't know about the extent of it. And because mainstream media was so very much controlled um, by government narrative, there would be an easy way to put a dampener on that. Like, I don't think there has been a cover up. I don't think that the, this has happened, but I'm just, I'm just saying that maybe we are just um, acutely aware of everything right now because we are so connected. Um, so, you know, on the one side that makes us easier to handle, but on the other side, this overwhelm of information is also making people hyper aware and making it maybe um, seem I mean, I don't want to say it's, blo it's, it's blowing it bigger than it is because I think it's huge. I think people aren't taking it seriously enough, but I do think that it's making people more aware of it. 
No, I, I mean, this is one of the ways where technology is, is maybe not helping is, is these, these centralized um, social media companies, whether it's or platforms, whether it's Twitter or Facebook. I've seen, I can't count how many grabs I've seen, graphs I've seen that have been driving me crazy. Um, I can't count how many, uh, you know, Twitter retorts when I'm just trying to get the news that are just, it, it, it hasn't made people better. Um, no. on these platforms. It's almost, it's made people worse. And I feel like it's the platform rules has to change. And as well, you know, as well as I being in the, in the crypto space, that it's almost the centralization of these platforms that, uh, that um, it, it might be at the root issue of, of all the problems we're seeing. Well, I think that um, there's sort of two sides to that. Um, on, on the one hand, I think that right now, like we have such competition in sources, like, I mean, there's read.cash, there's minds.com and there's all the you know, float.com, all of these places where people can get information that are alternative, but you're right. The bulk of our information comes from these very centralized platforms. And for example, um, because I cut, like right now, if you make a video about coronavirus, you're fine. But the people who started talking about this early, there's something going on in the algorithm, but they all got a black mark next to their name. So my videos have all mm. been demonetized since I started talking about coronavirus. And it doesn't and, matter what topic I'm talking about. And that's I when it counted. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it doesn't matter what I'm talking about now, uh, whether it's coronavirus or not, my videos are all demonetized at the moment. So um, there's something that happened where I triggered something and they were like, oh, she's dangerous. She's spreading information. And I, um, someone on, on Twitter posted this comment about how she was reading an a, a article about um, hydroxychloride, what, whatever that thing is. That uh, chloroquine. Yeah. Chloroquine. Yeah. We're all going to be able to pronounce that by the time. Yeah, well, exactly. It'd be a household name and part of our, all of our medicine cabinets. Um, but some, there was some uh, report and it was just a study about this and they shared it with someone, they shared it with their father in Google Drive and Google censored it. And she went to access this document and she got a notice saying, you do not have permission to access this. This is in her own Google Drive folder, but they're now censoring the information that you store in there, not even public, that you just store in there and share. So um, I think that it is interesting what information these companies have been thinking has been dangerous, what made them think that this is dangerous rather than helpful. Uh, it raises a lot of questions for me and alarms. And, um, and I, I worry just like you do about this centralization of these platforms because uh, before when the, you know, there are just a few channels on television and the government controlled everything, it's very easy to control the narrative. We think things are a lot more decentralized now, but when we are mostly relying on Google and Facebook and Twitter for most of our interactions and information, um, there's huge centralization there that I think we need to be aware of. And uh, we may, you know, information may be more controlled than we realize. Yeah, yeah. I was very surprised by that. There was one Medium article going around where the guy was saying, uh, oh, you know, coronavirus is not going to be that bad. What and, you know, he had graphs and stuff. And, People, you know, people were saying, hey, your graphs are wrong. You're not an epidemiologist, blah, 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 blah. Can't listen to this guy. He's a Republican, whatever. But like, it got taken down medium. It got taken off and like censored. And I'm like, you know, the arguments against it might be right, but what is going on here? Yeah. Like, you're not the first person to put bad graphs on medium. If they Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it I mean, is. It is really crazy. I mean, I've seen some shocking videos. People have yeah. sent me retorts to my tweets and they're like, well, I watched such and such cover this on his channel and uh, these are his graphs and it's, you know, it's no worse than the flu. And I just look at the numbers and I'm just like, oh gosh, this is really yeah. bad data that you're trying from there. But at the same time, I, I expect that, you know, the good, like, I hope that people are discerning enough to look into these things and I don't want to see stuff be taken down necessarily. I think right. it's scary when you have a platform where you're meant to be expressing your own opinion and that gets censored. I don't like that at all. So I think people should be able to make these videos, but I do hope that there's competition out there and better people come along and say, actually, this is wrong because of this. I'm debunking it here. Here is my expert that I'm going to, you know, I, I think that there are better ways to do it than censoring it because when you censor these things, you just create this festering wound. You 
create this undercurrent where people feel disenfranchised. Uh, they think, well, no one's listening to me. There's this big conspiracy. No one will hear my data. I would rather have that stuff out in the open and have smarter people come along and say, actually, here's how you're wrong. I want to see that stuff debated, not censored. Yeah, yeah, uh, I totally agree. Uh, and um, yeah, I don't know. There's no, there's nothing more to say about that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> other than um, other than it's been very frustrating. So let's let's turn back uh, to civil liberties because before this all went down, you were talking about Hong Kong. You were talking about privacy and encryption a lot. And I actually recommended to everyone on this show to listen to your New Year's detox episode. Oh, thank uh, you. Because it had like very specific and simple things that people do, can do to protect themselves online. And a lot of this stuff often seems very, you know, very theoretical and very, um, oh, you know, technical. It's like, oh, you have to do all these things. And it's like, ah, I don't want to deal with this. Who cares? You know? And so if there are specific things that people could do that are like very free and or, or low cost, uh, I really appreciated that. And there were some things that, hey, I needed to do that were uh, that were on that video. Yay! Um, but um, I saw that uh, you recently spoke about this Earn It bill, and I hadn't mm. heard of that before. Um, and so my understanding just from your headline, so correct me if I'm wrong, is it would be a law against encryption. Uh, isn't encryption just applying numbers and mathematics to data? Can they really outlaw that? Is that They can outlaw whatever they want. How, so how the way the they're numbers? going to do it is yeah. um, the government has, well, that's the issue. It's, it's tremendously hard to do this. And so the government has been trying to figure out, well, how do we get access to everything without banning this thing that is semi-protected under free speech, right? Yeah. Um, and they found this ingenious way to do it. by So, so basically... There is this section of existing law that protects companies that host other people's information online. So, for example, if you're a platform like Medium and someone on Medium posts something and it's illegal, you as Medium, the platform, is not going to be held liable for what people post on there. As long as, as soon as you find out that they're posting something illegal, you take it down. Um, now, this safe harbor is like the linchpin of the internet. It is the most important rule for freedom of speech on the internet. Because if there wasn't that rule, then you would have platforms censoring everything just in case. And they'd go overboard to do this. So safe harbor means I could, I, the platform isn't liable if I put out something. Exactly. Like Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what, I mean, and this is like just so tremendously important. EFF um, says that this is the most important rule for free speech. Um, now, earn it changes this and says, well, now you have to earn the privilege of uh, having this law. It's not going to automatically apply to every company. And you can earn the privilege of having this law, this safe harbor, by following our guidelines. Mm. And the guidelines are going to be set by the most vocal opponents of encryption that exist at the moment. Uh, politicians who have been completely, like Lindsey Graham and uh, Bill Barr, and the, this, the, the, William Barr, the current Attorney General, would be the chair of the committee that is writing all these rules. And if you look back over all the things he said over the last year about encryption, I mean, it's, it's terrifying. He has wanted to ban encryption for a really long time, but he couldn't figure out how to do it. In this recent uh, press conference with- uh, why, why, are they so, why are they so obsessed with this? They've always been obsessed with them. I mean, this, this, this is not a new battle. You go back to the yeah. cypherpunks in the 90s who fought this battle as well. The government did not like the idea that there could be communications that they couldn't read. They like this all-powerful tool being access, able to access everything. And so back in the 90s, they regulated encryption as munitions uh, to stop it being exported because they didn't want other countries to be able to say things that they couldn't eavesdrop on either. So it's this ongoing battle and the cypherpunks won back then, but they didn't win this conclusive battle and that's the end of it. This has been ongoing since then and the government's found all these ways. Now, start of last year, you had Facebook after all of their scandals against privacy. Um, they turned around and they said, okay, we're going to become a privacy 
focused platform. We're going to encrypt all messages. We're really going to push to make sure that we're protecting our consumers because we didn't protect them before and now we're going to protect them. And the government pushed back and said, no, no, you can't do this. And they wrote an open letter to Facebook and said, no, you cannot create communications that we cannot access. And they just like, it, it was this giant push to the point where Lindsey Graham literally said in Congress, um, you know, if you, because they're talking to these people from Facebook and you're talking to people from Google who are pushing back and saying, no, encryption is what makes the internet work. You need to be able to have private things on the internet. Otherwise, you open it up to hostile government uh, agencies, to hackers, to um, all kinds of people, to e even down to like local level, like an abusive ex-husband or, you know, we need private communications for lawyers, for civil rights workers, for um, all kinds of people who are, who are working in, in delicate fields all over the world, journalists um, as well. And so like, because this is such an important thing, you have these companies standing up and saying, no, we need this private communication. And they're explaining it very clearly. And the government's kind of turning this blind eye um, and saying, well, you know, just put a back door in that's only for government. And these companies are trying to explain and say, no, it doesn't work like that. It's not a back door just for government. That's a back door for everyone. That, that putting a back door in, in encryption means it's no longer encrypted. That's, that, that's not encryption anymore. Mm -hmm. And so then Lindsey Graham responded and said, you will find a way to do this or we will do this for you. You are either mm -hmm. the, the solution or you are the problem. And he was so heated, lo and behold, a few months later, uh, out comes this bill that his name is on that is called the Earn It Bill. And it is basically saying you will abide by our guidelines. We have not written those guidelines yet, but you will pass this bill that gives us a blank check to write whatever guidelines we want and change them at any time. Um, otherwise, you will no longer get uh, access to the most important freedom of speech law protecting the internet right now. So it's a terrifying situation where they literally have found a way to, you know, uh, coerce companies to not use encryption. So they wouldn't be technically making it illegal. They would just be saying, we're taking away these key fundamental necessary protections for you. Um, if you don't, if you decide to go ahead and use encryption. So it's, uh, oh, it's okay. So it's sneaky. So I, I understand the uh, I understand how it's going to work. It's not like if you if I'm literally um, you know taking out my pad and going through uh, the what is it RSA two fifty six and doing it. I'm like, <laughs> a, a, a policeman's going to come in here and say, "What is this? What is this?" <laughs> But what you do have to make, be aware of is if you are saying, well, I'm just going to send this encrypted message through Signal, yep. you don't know where the Signal has been compromised because mm. Signal is liable and they wouldn't be um, covered by this very important rule. It says if people are doing something illegal in your platform and you, you, know, you uh, don't know about it, you're protected. So I think you should presume that any platform, any device, any hardware, any app that you're using, um, you should presume that it's going to be compromised if this bill goes through because companies cannot afford the liability of, you know, uh, making sure everyone on their platform is abiding by the law 100%. What's the status of the bill? Are, is it, are you worried they're going to sneak it into one of those uh, coronavirus Oh, absolutely or... terrified. That's what they do every time. You know, yeah. they, they, like, you look at what just passed where we had, where Trump tweets out and says, congratulations, America. And, yeah. uh, and hidden in this bill is this giant surveillance thing that allows the, you know, it's $500 million that is going towards um, uh, tracking citizens using their cell phone data to make sure that we're following movements. And, and it's like, you know, in, in Singapore, they have a much better way to do this. They have these voluntary apps and you can, you can use it if you want and it helps track down, it helps contain things. But like sneaking in this surveillance part into a, into a stimulus bill, it's, I don't know, it's terrifying for me. Yeah, yeah. And so if they pass it, I guess, I th well, we've got to live with it or think of ways around it. I don't know. Well, you're just going to have to rely on technology and rely on companies uh, to keep producing. Like, I mean, software is easier. You can release software anonymously and you can't be targeted and it can mm. be decentralized. Um, you can't decentralize hardware. You need a central factory. You need people, you know, physically yeah. in a location making things. So it is going to be really hard to find devices that will not be compromised if this goes through. But a hardware company wouldn't be liable for someone using it to communicate stuff would they or how, how i mean 
I don't know, they can yeah. write whatever they want into these bills. Like, I mean, it, we, it, we 3D print our technology that we yeah, can source that, I mean, online. That's what we're doing. Absolutely. For. That's going to be the future. Technology yeah. like 3D printing is probably going to be the future of privacy and, and freedom for individuals. Yeah. So I, it's a little early to um, ha talk about, you know, decentralized Facebook or decentralized medium that, that, somehow gets around this law, I think that would be difficult. But let's turn to cryptocurrency. Well, I mean, library, library is yeah. already decentralizing content. It's a fantastic site. It's really the oh. only purely decentralized uh, content site. Yeah, yeah no, talk, talk about that. There are people working on it. I think it's a little early to expect it to be the... the Right, right. No, I think that, um, so library, I covered it several years ago on the Stossel show because what happened was um, you had universities that were being forced to take down all of their uh, free lectures that they were putting out there as a community surface, uh, basically because there were these rules that were introduced that said if these aren't available for everyone, they can't be available to anyone. So unless you, you know, subtitle all of them, unless you have like versions for people with every kind of impairment or, or whatever, you can't have it available to anyone. And so the amount it would cost for them to go through and make sure it's all like approved subtitling would have been astronomical and they can afford it. So they've just said, okay, we'll just take it all down. All this wonderful free content. So, um, so you had people who just said, okay, we'll just mirror MIT's content and we'll just put it all on library um and it's a completely de decentralized system that can't ever be taken down um same with like defense distributed when they had these blueprints for 3d printed gun um and so, so just so i understand technically like there there's something that's the equivalent of a bitcoin node where this stuff is being mirrored all around and it's Exactly. So there are different ways to decentralize things like the same way that we have like torrents, uh, if you've ever used a torrent and things sure. exist in people's own computers. So it's like a similar mechanism to that, but it essentially means the outcome is that you can't take this information down. It's always available. And so I've had a, seen a lot of content creators migrate only onto library. They've just gone off YouTube entirely because library is just such an important tool right now. And I think it's going to get even more important. So I think that we'll look to companies like that as things get scarier on, um, in, in terms of encryption and all of that. So this could be a dumb question, but if you have something on, on, on library, is it never taken down? Like could the person who uploaded it ever delete it? Like how, is this stuff going to be up 50 years from now? How do you... Um, That's a you great know? question. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, actually. I'm, I'm, I, that's a, a good question for someone like um, uh, Jeremy Kaufman. Otherwise Kaufmann. it just grows and grows and grows and then... Um, yeah, and then there's a lot. Well, I mean, that's exactly what's happening in the databases that the NSA have. They it's literally true. have the capabilities to have to record every single thing in perpetuity, keep it forever. Um, so that is the sort of storage we're looking at these days. Things like the NSA's dream is to have a permanent record that can never be erased that just keeps storing everything forever. And then, I mean, Snowden says that they've achieved that. They now have the capabilities mm -hmm. to do that. So I think that should make everyone... Um, very scared. <laughs> okay, let's try to be positive now. I'm going to turn to <laughs> cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. I taught, I, uh, well, same, same thing happened in my co hosted show yesterday. I'm like, I said, let's end on a positive note. And then we said something positive. And just as I was about to turn it off, he went and said something negative again. <gasps> so you're, you're like, Naomi, don't do that. We want to see a smile <laughs> no, it's and a okay. song. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, so, all right. So this weekend, I'm hosting. My, my, my annual tech retreat, which is basically, I take some friends where we make technology predictions on different time scales, two, five, 10 years. We've already been doing it for five years. And, um, uh, and, and so we get to go back on our previous predictions. Um, it's a fun thing that we do. This year, it's gonna be the exotic location of everybody's own home or oh, wherever they happen how to be fancy. stuck. We don't actually go, we, we don't travel very far. We'll go like, you know. New Haven, whatever. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, one, I, we're usually very optimistic on technology, but the one that I'm consistently too conservative on is my cryptocurrency prediction. So mm -hmm. I looked back at 2015 and, and I looked what my prediction was and I was like, and I had a price prediction in there. I said, Bitcoin could be over $2,000 by uh, 2020. And that, that was like seen as absurdly high. So <laughs> that, that has a little, uh, um, it, it, 
that does give a little perspective. I, I didn't see the Bitcoin cash forks coming. That was de definitely one that took me by surprise because I, I sort of, um, you know, I, I assumed things were going to be a lot more static than what, than they were. Uh, so help me make my predictions for the next round. What, let's start like in, in, in the short term, what this global pandemic, the political reaction to it, the reaction in the markets, including the crypto markets, has, do you think anything has been revealed about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, uh, about the ecosystem over the last few weeks that we, we didn't know before, weren't sure about before? Yeah, I, I, I definitely do think so. Um, I, to be honest, I was, I was quite shocked when I saw the FDIC insurers start tweeting with this very like ambient music, like, please don't take your money out of the banks. Please don't keep them. In oh, offices. I heard that. Oh, it's very bad. It'll be dangerous. Keep I was like, I, when I wasn't insured. worried about my money in the bank. Then, I was like, now, yeah, it's like that <laughs> meme where, where it's like nobody. Yeah. FDIC, <laughs> your money is safe. And everyone's yeah. like, what we, we presumed it was. What's wrong now? Like, yeah, yeah. So I think that what's been revealed, I mean, you've seen markets tank and you saw Bitcoin go with it and then Bitcoin stops tanking and sort of plateaued while yeah. markets kept tanking. And that's the first time we've seen Bitcoin decoupled from the markets because what happens when you have um, people who are losing a lot of money in their stocks is they need to get whatever's most liquid and get that money and just back up whatever they have so that they don't get margin called. Um, also, they co can cover their losses or whatever so they can keep their businesses going. And so you've always seen Bitcoin be very correlated with the markets. That's the first time we've kind of seen it be decoupled significantly. Um, so that was interesting. Number two, we're at a stage now where last financial crisis, Bitcoin was created because of the last financial crisis. Yeah. This financial crisis, people know what Bitcoin is. This is the first time we're going to be going through a real economic struggle where people have an alternative money that isn't controlled by the government. That is going to be fascinating to watch play out. Uh, I'm very interested to see what happens there. Um, I think that, especially with FDIC insurance, like what we're seeing is, is the Federal Reserve literally saying like, we are going to keep printing money until we need to stop. We're just gonna keep going. You have Trump give a press conference where he says, why don't we have the lowest interest rates in the world? You know, why does Germany yeah. and Japan have low interest rates? We should have, we're the best country in the world. We should have the lowest interest rates. And anyone who's economically literate is going, did, did he really just advocate for like lowering it for like what? So people are getting more economically aware. More people know what the Federal Reserve is than ever before. And that really was started by Ron Paul. And then it continued because of this Bitcoin revolution and people started to learn about this. I think that we're going to see us uh, as, as going to an era where people are more prepared than they could have been in the past. Before you would have had people stocking up on precious metals to try and hedge themselves or you know, perhaps trying to just take their money out of out of the state where it can be um, completely hyperinflated away, which it's not completely off uh, off the table. That is definitely something that could happen. Um, so people now have a different, very easy electronic way that they can shift their money around, which yeah. we haven't seen. So my prediction is that this. Crisis is going to be bad economically, um, but there are ways to protect yourselves that we haven't had before. And that's what excites me. It's not that this is going to be a way for you all to get rich and it's going to moon and whatever. It's like, no, this is just going to be a way for you to help protect yourself. Before, you would have been left with no option, um, but now you do have an option. So I am, um, that makes me very hopeful. Yeah. And another thing we have now that we didn't have then, all those money printing memes that are going around the internet, <laughs> right. uh, that, <laughs> so, uh, on, on Reddit and, and stuff like that. Um, okay, so, oh, okay, let's talk about the halving. I have, I have mentioned halving here. Before, a few months ago, I was talking about the halving. It's in seven weeks. That means that the issuance of Bitcoin is going to be cut in half. The stock to flow ratio, which is the amount of new Bitcoin in circulation in relation to how much already exists, to my understanding, this current halving is going to make that comparable to gold, and that's permanent. In four years, it's going to go much higher than gold. Uh, is there anything that is there anything to look for in this particular milestone? Uh, is, um, is 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 there any? What's the what's the story on what's the story on that? How would you how would you explain that to people? I mean, gosh, I would say that all of this stuff is already 
priced in to to Bitcoin. A lot of people say, "Well, oh, when this the, happens, for the price, yeah. right?" Yeah, but I, but there there there's something to be said about the fact that it's not it's not, not as circu- all- it's not going to be released uh, yeah, yeah. as much, and there are fewer people who are going to get Bitcoin. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, and some people say that that's this terrible thing that the people who got into cryptocurrency early, you know, they get all the Bitcoin and it's an unfair distribution. And uh, I mean, it's kind of like saying someone who had the foresight to go and found a company that's very valuable, they get all the stock options, you know, it's like, yeah. well, definitely if you're the one who goes to Costco early because you've been watching a pandemic spread and you buy your resources, you know, you're going to get there and you're going to be the one who's prepared. I think it's all the same thing. It's like with Bitcoin, if you were looking into it and you were like, wow, you know, alternative money is really interesting. This is this Hayekian idea of competing currencies. I'm excited. I'm, I'm going all in. Number one, that's a giant risk. I know people who went all in in like 2010. And when like there's, that's, there's uh, nothing going on in the Bitcoin economy. And they're like, no, I see the potential of this. I can see what could happen from this and I'm ready to bet on it. Um, I think that that's great. So the people who did get into this early, I think it's awesome that they now have the resources and a lot of them just putting that money back into developing all kinds of things, decentralized platforms that are now going to help us in this increasingly totalitarian censorship state. Um, there are all kinds of things that this technology affords us. So I think it's uh, it's great that those people have access to some of that. In terms of like the harvening and like what that means for more people coming in, I really don't think it changes much at all. I don't think it's a, it's like a big difference. Cool. So this is th- this last question. I wouldn't ask if I didn't have my um, my my future predictions brainstorm this weekend. But uh, but I'll ask it because it's a little bit um, it's a little bit uh, you know throw caution to the wind and just make predictions. Type <laughs> of thing. But what's your long term? What's something long term that you think about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin that maybe five years, maybe two and a half years, maybe ten years that kind of seems outlandish to most people now, but might actually happen. Um, and let's let's take out price. Uh, I don't want to do that again. That's kind of don't want to do price. Yeah. But it's just something to do with crypto uh, yeah. and where it's going to be in the future. Um, yeah. All right. So so we've just started to see that like in the when the Democrats put forward their proposal for this stimulus package and they included in there this digital dollar uh, that's going to be be released. And it's funny that Maxine Waters was the one who um, who was the head of that, and she's the one who led the campaign to shut down Facebook's Libra. Uh, and now she's coming out with her own digital dollar. So I, I, that's always interesting. But I do think that there is going to be tremendous momentum around governments building their own digital dollars. I think it's going to make us worse off, not better off. Um, but one thing that it could do is introduce people to the idea of these purely you know, um, uh, digital currencies. Uh, we still we have an, a sense of that now because most of our, our purchases get paid for on our cards, on Venmo, on PayPal, on the internet. Um, but I think this is one step closer to people understanding that these things can exist only in digital form. So I think that we're just going to see this normalization of um, digital currencies and in terms of cryptocurrencies in particular, I think that we're just going to see continued increased adoption, especially if we're coming into a period where there might be significant inflation, where there's going to be um, you know, little to no reason for money to keep their money in banks if they're basically paying for the privilege of doing so now that we've got like negative interest rates. I think that cryptocurrency is really, there's going to be a lot of education around why this is helpful for people um, and increased use in that sphere. So, I mean, I'm, I'm never good with price predictions. I never make them. So I'm glad you took that off the table. But I do think that we're just going to continue to see steady increase in awareness and growth. That's going to be met with the counterparty of um, governments coming in with increased smear campaigns as people pull their money out. And uh, so you're going to see a lot of pushback there. You know, crypto is only for criminals. Crypto is bad for the environment. Crypto is... Um, I, I you know, covered what, that one. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a lot there that they could do, but I think yeah. still, if you have enough alternative media sites, you could still get the message out. And so we're in for a battle. It's going to be a big battle over the next five years. Um, but I think it's a battle that ultimately uh, it's going to give people more options and it's going to make people more free at the end of the day. To, to dig into that a little bit, what what's a use case that you've maybe been seeing that you think uh, think might be uh, th- that's interesting to you that uh, people might not think about. 
Ooh, okay, so right now Cause, it's cause the very... obvious. Yeah, I, I mean, I talk about the obvious ones a lot, which is you know, hodling and uh, you know, sending stuff back and forth between countries. But mm -hmm. what are people actually using using it for right now? I mean, okay, hodling. well, I can see an increased use case right now when you have such a. Um, uh, such sparse supplies. Um, everyone is looking for the same things. They're all looking for gloves. They're all looking for masks. Yeah. They're all looking for hand sanitizer, and they're all looking for toilet paper for some reason. Um, yeah. So well, hold on. I, th I think they were actually right because I found it, when you're stuck in the same place, I, I'm, I'm using twice the amount of toilet paper. I don't want to go out. I think I should have gotten more toilet paper <laughs> two weeks ago. Well, I, I mean, I hate to say well, it. But. What we have is we've started to see Amazon kick off people who are selling at, at hand sanitizer because they're mm. trying to avoid price gouging. They're yeah. trying to avoid a way for a, the price mechanism to actually work, which I think is insane. Yeah. Um, but because of that, I think you're going to see more gray markets pop up uh, online. I've already seen a couple of Places. One of them is just a centralized place that connects you with people. Um, other one, you've got things like Haven, which is a place where it's completely decentralized. You can sell whatever you want. I think that's going to be increased use case for um, blockchain technology and for cryptocurrency, um, especially uh, back to what you're saying about moving money in between countries. Yeah, sure. That's great for saving fees. Right now, it's great because they're putting bans on the amount of cash you can withdraw. So if you don't want to withdraw cash, and for example, in Australia, they have like a limit you can spend a hundred dollars on on cryptocurrency a month and that's all you can take out of your bank account like they've been put it like really dampening that so you know what you can do like if you have different accounts you can transfer money electronically like there's just a lot a lot uh, um it's a lot easier to do with your money what you want to do with your money thanks to cryptocurrency all right. Well, that's good to know. Um, I will uh, continue to cover all that story here on, on the local maximum. And of course, I'll be listening to your podcast to, uh, to, to get the latest and uh, look at what to look into. Um, I'm going to link everyone to your stuff, NaomiBrockwell.tv. Is that right? Uh, yeah, you could. Well, if you go to uh, NaomiBrockwell.com, you'll be able to find com. everything there. Yep. Okay. Uh, but I've got a bunch of websites. I need to just link them all together. <laughs> Okay, great. I'll link to your Twitter. I'll link to your, um, what's your podcast called again? I'm sorry. I, I don't know. It's just, I just call it Naomi Brockwell TV. Naomi Brockwell's Pod TV. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. Okay, that, that's the easiest to remember. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. One thing that I've learned today, aside from everything we've just talked about, is I need a better background if I'm going to be stuck in here for six <laughs> weeks. Because, well, usually I have the... Um, Brooklyn skyline out here, but it's a little sunny right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it almost looks like I am in, um, my God, it got even sunnier as we've been talking. It looks like I'm in um, some sci-fi um, movie. It's pretty something. cool. You're living in the future <laughs> there, Max. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, at night I have the sky, but I, I think I could do better. I, th I have a lot of cool stuff here, but if I turn everything around, then I have to clean up. I don't want to. Oh, you don't want to have to do that. Yeah, no, I need, I need a corner. I need to have local maximum over here. I don't know. We're going to figure this stuff out. Uh, we're going to figure this stuff out. So Naomi, thank you so much for, um, uh, for, uh, for taking the time and sharing all of that with us. Um, I really appreciate it. I know my listeners will really appreciate it. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. All right. That was really fantastic. All the links will go in the show notes page at localmaxradio.com slash 112, 112. Uh, we also took video over Zoom, as you could tell from the last part of the conversation. I'm not I'm still early with that. I need like a, a, a studio or something. Not going to happen right now. Uh, but I will upload that to YouTube for sure. I already had my tech retreat this weekend on Zoom as well, and it was a smashing success. So I will update you on all of that next week so you could see what predictions we made and what we're talking about. So that's next week on The Local Maximum. The show will go on. Have a great week, everyone. That's the show. Remember to check out the website at localmaxradio.com. If you want to contact me, the host, or ask a question that I can answer on the show, send an email to localmaxradio at gmail.com. The show is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and more. If you want to keep up, remember to subscribe to The Local Maximum on one of these platforms and to follow my Twitter account, at Max Sklar. Have a great week. Feel the power.